The brand new Arcs of Omen campaign that's currently unfolding in Warhammer 40k right now is absolutely nuts. There's just so many wild things happening in this book. From Abaddon raising up a fleet of undead warships the size of moons, some mysterious super weapon more powerful than anything we've encountered in the lore so far, and as is tradition, a brand new chaos invasion. But the most crazy thing of all is a brand new demonic antagonist that seeks to challenge the four chaos gods, becoming the fifth and eventually overpowering all of them. His name is Vashtor, the Archophane, and this guy, although being brand new to the lore, has made a pretty crazy impression. Despite how very clearly chaotic this guy looks, he's a different kind of evil from what we're used to with chaos demons. He's mathematically evil. But who exactly is he, and what is he all about? What major role does he have to play within the Arcs of Omen campaign? And what is the nightmarish realm that he rules over known as the Forge of Souls? Well, today we're going to get to the bottom of all of that and a whole lot more. But first, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, and then we're going to dive headfirst into the Grimdark. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you know I wear the same dope t-shirts in just about every single one of them. Well, they come from this really awesome clothing company called Into the AM, and they're the sponsor of this week's video. I can honestly say that for the price, these are the best shirts I've found in a really long time. They're super soft and comfortable. They're around 20% longer than a normal t-shirt, meaning they don't rise up every single time I lift my arms up. I can't tell you how many times I've had a t-shirt that I absolutely love, and after a couple of times through the wash, it ends up shrinking, and I basically just have to throw it away. If you're like me and you've won the genetic lottery of having a big chest, long torso, and short legs, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm like a corgi with a dad bod. The artwork that they use on their shirts is absolutely incredible, and even after multiple times through the wash, I've experienced no fading at all. Pro tip from me to you on how to keep your graphic tees looking the best for a long time. Whenever you wash them, flip them inside out first, and make sure you use cold water whenever possible. Into the AM didn't tell me to say that, but I've been wearing graphic tees for a long time, and that's always worked for me. If you're like me and you're a big fan of cool graphic tees, you can get three of them bundled together for $60. Or if you want something a bit more professional looking, but is still super comfy, you can get three of their basic tees for only $49.95, which is a great deal on its own, but my viewers can save even more. If you click on the link in the description of this video, or use the code WESHAMMER at checkout, you can save 10% off your entire order. So go to IntoTheAM.com today and pick yourself out something awesome. Thanks again to Into the AM for sponsoring this video, and with that out of the way, let's get back into the grimdark. It's a commonly held truth in the Warhammer universe that the more people share in some form of collective belief or experience similar emotions en masse, then the more that can begin to manifest within the warp. Now this is true of every emotion, thought, and idea generated in the minds of every sentient creature across time and space. But when it comes to those inquisitive and curious mortals, the scientists, inventors, artisans, and tinkerers of all sorts, despite normally having the best intentions, have always had the potential, and unfortunately often the wherewithal, to see their ingenuity set upon dark and depraved paths. The engineer who set out to better his society is in turn made aware of new theories and systems that could be used to unleash untold havoc the likes of which no world had ever seen. The scientist, who sought to rid their planet of disease, sees their morals inevitably corrupted and starts taking bribes to instead concoct ever more virulent pathogens and chemical weapons. The tinkerer who designed internal systems to better the life of mankind has instead utilized their creations to create weapons and war engines to bring death to our enemies. Deep within the warp, the concepts of science and technology push down this nightmarish path, meld with the arcane and coalesce in a cancerous amalgamation these gross of collective beliefs swell and attract other similar emotions, and all too often end up gaining sentience. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics can be wielded like a weapon to bring salvation and enlightenment to those who wish for it, or damnation to those who would seek to wield it to their own nefarious ends. It is belief in the latter that saw the rise of an entity known as Vashtor the Archophane, the master of the Soul Forge. There are many that theorize that Vashtor was born out of some ancient arms race during a long-forgotten galaxy-spanning conflict, a war that saw both sides engineer ever more terrifying engines of unrelenting carnage and destruction that would lay waste to entire sectors. Now, some believe the demon can trace its origins back to the Dark Age of Technology, while others believe he may be far, far older. Vashtor himself has manifested only seldomly throughout recorded history, now, many individuals that study the manifestation of warp entities such as him have never actually heard his name uttered aloud, 
The records that correspond with his appearance only make mention of something akin to a technological demonic boogeyman. Most mentions of his name that do exist are recorded in corrupted and blasphemous scrap code, or exist as echoes recorded on distorted Vox channels. Every syllable of his name, accompanied by a cacophony of disembodied wails and shrieks within the static. Now, records on Vastor are incredibly rare, but the ones that do exist mention that the creature's return is always heralded by cataclysmic catastrophes. It's still unclear whether or not Vastor was just drawn to these conflicts out of morbid curiosity, or if he was the instrument that orchestrated them. So what exactly is he? Is he a demon prince or some type of new chaos god? Well, by all accounts, he's neither. He's something much greater than a demon prince and claims not to owe any allegiance to any of the four ruinous powers. But on the other hand, he's also not on the level of a chaos god, at least not yet. We as the audience are first introduced to Vashtar during the Arcs of Omen campaign. His very first appearance occurs after a group of Dark Mechanicus tech priests aboard the Vengeful Spirit use a corrupted data tome that they had found in order to use its supernatural powers to aid in the ship's repairs. Now, unbeknownst to them, this was all part of Vastor's plans. He had intended for them to find the tome and to hide it away from the War Master's gaze in the exact same way in which they had. Needless to say, the ritual that the tech priests were engaged in doesn't go according to plan and ends up unleashing havoc across the ship. Abaddon is furious and is trying to find out the cause of it when he discovers their ritual site. Before he can punish them for their actions, he receives a call over the Vox telling him that something is happening deeper within the ship. When he goes to investigate, he sees the telltale signs of a demon emerging. He's about to give the order for his Terminators to open fire, but something stays his hand. When Vashtor fully emerges, he ends up having a conversation with him. The craziness that's been going on aboard the ship is actually Vashtor doing everything he can to repair it. He tells the Warmaster that he can consider this a gift and that he hopes to form an alliance with him. Abaddon doesn't trust any demon, let alone this guy, but the more they talk, the more he begins to feel something like a kinship with him. When the topic of the ruinous powers comes up, Vashtor spits on their name. He says he is the master of the soul forges and owes no allegiance to any of the four gods. Something that Abaddon can respect, considering he's been staying off their advancements for 10,000 years. Abaddon notes that there's something strange about the way Vashtor talks. It's incredibly straightforward. Most of the time when demons end up speaking to mortals, their speech is a bunch of metaphors and riddles all wrapped up together. It's difficult to pry true meaning apart from what they're actually saying. Not so with Vashtor. There's a cold and unrelenting logic to everything that he says. He claims that as the master of the Soul Forges, he wanted to join the great game in earnest. He wanted to rise in power to the point where he'd be able to take his seat amongst the pantheon of other gods and to eventually surpass all of them. He believed in order to do this, he would have to help the Despoiler fulfill a great prophecy and aid him in securing one of the galaxy's greatest weapons. Now, it's not really apparent to us as the audience exactly what kind of deal the Archifane and the Warmaster end up striking, but it is said at one point that they deliberated behind closed doors for multiple hours, and when Abaddon came back, he had a crazy smirk on his face. He says, quote, For all their prating piety, the lackeys of the Corpse Emperor are greater traitors than we will ever be. At least our rebellion was honest. As I'm sure most of you are well aware, the four ruinous powers have carved out for themselves their own section of the Realm of Chaos that directly reflects their essence and personality. Korn has the Realm of Brass and Blood, Slanesh has the Six Circles of Seduction, Zinch has the Crystalline Labyrinth, and Nurgle has his Plague Gardens. So it stands to reason that if Vashtor was going to become a fifth Chaos God, then he would also have a similar realm that reflects his essence. Well, it turns out that he actually does, and it's known as the Forge of Souls, or the Soul Forge. They kind of go back and forth on that in the book. But what exactly is this terrible place, and why is it so important? The Forge of Souls is a mechanical hellscape located deep within the swirling, formless wastes of the Realm of Chaos. It is set against a blackened sky, choked by dark, oily fumes that billow forth from its infinite forges. Every square inch is saturated in the pungent, burning smell of forbidden mechanical sorcery. Everywhere you go, you can hear a cacophony of wailing and tortured spirits that screech in tempo with the thundering of massive pistons and the grinding of ancient gears. This is the realm where the demonic forge masters of chaos endlessly toil away, binding the souls of mortals and demons alike into their tortured mechanical creations. The legions of barely sentient nightmare creatures that are enslaved to Vashtor's will continuously churn out all manner of terrifying demonic weapons. It is here that the perverse technologies and sorceries of chaos are fused with arcane metals to create vast armories of jagged possessed blades, weeping swords, 
and the rest of the blasphemous relics wielded by the Neverborn and their mortal champions alike. It was in this hellish place that originated the construction method for demon engines and is notably where the soul grinders are forged, terrifying fusions of demonic souls from within the warp with the engines of war that originated in the physical universe. This is a realm of sustained techno blasphemy, a land of dark iron and steam, of clattering cogs and pounding pistons, where infernal packs are signed in blood and oil and the unholy symbiosis of the physical and immaterial is made manifest. The Soul Forges for the most part remain neutral in the great game, supplying all four of the ruinous powers with weapons and armaments to aid their vast and terrible armies. Regardless of their allegiances, any demon may approach the Forge in order to enter into a pact with its brokers. The reasons vary from demon to demon, but many may see it as the fastest route to achieving power, seeking to utilize the undeniable might of the Soul Forges in whatever crusade they find themselves in and thus through their victories, achieve the favor of their patron deity. Other demons may be seeking a way to circumvent the spiritual bonds and lingering shame of banishment from the physical universe. By being bound into a physical body of iron and steel, they can then once more re-enter our plane. Vashtor and his brokers are more than happy to forge contracts with such individuals in exchange for an agreed upon price of mortal souls. These souls will be reaped by the demon in question and offered to the Soul Forge as payment. Once the deal is struck, the demon will be fed into the Soul Forge, its machines crushing, battering, and ripping them apart, taking their essence and melding it with that of a war engine. They'll be reborn as a Soul Grinder, a Calamity Engine, or an Infernal Bombard to name but a few. But regardless of the form they take, the entity will unquestionably emerge more powerful and well-armed than they had been before they entered. Demons that approach the Soul Forge with less to offer may end up paying their debts by serving a period enslaved to Vashtor's will. Whether they serve in his armies or deep within the heart of his forge, Vashtor will always be able to find a use for them. Now, here's the thing about Vashtor that really sets him apart from the other gods. It's not in his nature to lie or trick. He doesn't want to deceive any that would enter into a contract with him. He's pretty much brutally honest and pragmatic. Such is the nature of the mathematical pursuit of technological advancements that spawned him. His contracts are explicit in their conditions. Uh, conversely, however, it's also not in the nature of demons to take things at face value. They are creatures of chaos and are thus not used to dealing with an entity that speaks so directly and literally. The chaotic nature of demons causes them to see things that aren't there and derive their own meanings from these contracts, which in turn ends up working against them and always leaves Vashtar with the most to be gained. With every defeat that those bound to him end up suffering, their soul debt rises even higher. The self-inflicted bondage of these demons keeps them indebted to the master of the soul forges for all time. You can think of Vashtar like a twisted demonic mob boss that knows exactly how to get what he wants and keeps the demons foolish enough to sign a contract with him, never quite able to fully pay off their interest. Or perhaps it's more accurate to think of him as a great and powerful arms dealer, one whose inventions are so masterfully crafted that none of the four gods would dare move against him, regardless of the threat he poses. They realize that if they were to do this, they would end up as the only god he refuses to sell to, which would put them at a significant disadvantage within the great game. Vashtor is an ally to none but himself, and his importance within the great game cannot be understated, even if he isn't a chaos god. That may end up changing, however, as his influence and power continue to rise. Eventually, he'll reach a point where he's able to stand amongst the other four, and perhaps even surpass them in power. So exactly how powerful is Vashtor? Well, the fact remains that he has legions of demons that have become indebted to him or choose to follow him willingly into battle, mean that he is able to unleash bloody wars in his name, and when he does choose to physically manifest, he is a terrifyingly powerful monster who is able to bend reality to his will and can soar across real space amidst storms of psychic lightning. He has been shown to have complete mastery over anything mechanical, electronic, made of metal, or just about any other material or object that does not exist in its natural state. Upon his first meeting with the War Master, one of the first acts he commits to gain his favor is to completely heal his flagship. Many of the wounds that had been inflicted on it over the countless centuries had not been able to be repaired by his legion of tech priests. And by all accounts, when he had finished, the vengeful spirit was operating in its prime once again. It was by Vashtor's will that Abaddon and the Black Legion were able to leash the mighty space hulks, massive amalgamations of hundreds of ships that had been lost within the warp and fused together by its chaotic energies. Together, they were able to drag them back into real space and the Dark Mechanicum forces aligned with Abaddon carved mile-long warding sigils into their surface, while Vashtor sent coiling bolts of warp energy into the captive hulks. 
The energy burrowed inside of the ships, creating a synapse-like network of flesh metal, uniting each of the mechanical systems throughout the dozens if not hundreds of ships that made up each hulk. The neural network basically brought them to life and created what were known as the Arcs of Omen. These were monstrously powerful ships and potentially the largest and most destructive ever mentioned in any of Warhammer's lore. But we'll cover them in much more detail in the Arcs of Omen deep dive video that I'm already hard at work on. Unlike his kin within the warp, the nature of chaos is something that doesn't seem to have come to define the Archophane. Avastor is an entity of ordered and meticulous evil. He is the literal embodiment of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics taken to their extremes in the pursuit of violence and destruction. Whether or not he'll end up achieving his goals of becoming a new chaos god remains to be seen, but he is unquestionably one of the most powerful allies that Abaddon has been able to gain, and together, they pose one of the most significant threats the Imperium has ever seen. At the time of this recording, only book one of the Arcs of Omen campaign has actually been released, and we're just starting to scratch the surface of what the Archophane is all about. Now, Games Workshop has promised that he's going to be a prominent character in the lore going forward, and they've already announced the next two books in the series, one of which bearing his name, and hopefully is going to focus specifically on the Archophane. So I'll definitely be revisiting him once we know a bit more about his character. I just have so many questions about this guy, and the thing I'm personally most interested in is how the Dark Mechanicum views him. For all intents and purposes, if this guy manages to achieve the goal of becoming a new Chaos power, then it would be like a darkened version of the Machine God worshipped by the Mechanicus. And it would be really interesting to see if an avatar of the Omnissiah, other than the Emperor of course, managed to rise up within the warp in order to challenge him. And I also think it's important to point out that it's not impossible that we would see him become a new Chaos God as there's already been a precedent that's been set for this over an Age of Sigmar. If you don't know too much about Sigmar's lore, I'll keep it brief. A few years back, there was an event where Slaanesh ended up getting captured by the Elves. And while they were imprisoned, the Horned Rat God, the God of the Skaven, managed to take Slaanesh's throne for themselves. By the time Slaanesh was back in the picture, the Horned Rat had already gained so much power that he was on the same level as the other Chaos Gods and thus is treated as the Fifth. There's also been rumors that Malekith, now known as Malarian in Age of Sigmar, has also become a Chaos God. Although the lore on this is a little bit shaky because it basically just comes from a single line in one of the books. The major takeaway here is that it's not completely off the table that something similar could happen in 40k. There's a lot of really interesting places that they could go with his lore, and I'm super curious to hear what you guys think down in the comments. What role do you think he's going to have in the storyline going forward? Do you think Games Workshop is foreshadowing something big with the Dark Mechanicum? And just in general, what are your thoughts on this guy? Do you like him, hate him, or are you kind of indifferent? We're all experiencing this lore for the first time together as it's brand new. And I want to hear all of your theories, no matter how crazy they are. Now, if you like Warhammer and you want to know more about this universe, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, as I have so much more I want to tell you about. And I'm also working on a full deep dive of the Arcs of Omen book one right now, and I would hate for you to miss it. Thanks again to everybody who supports my work, and if it wasn't for you guys watching these videos, I wouldn't be able to do this full time. So again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And with all that out of the way, I'll catch y'all in the next one.